here. So our next speaker is Dr. Cynthia Luko. She's a clinical psychologist and clinical neuropsychologist, and she'll be uh, talking about pediatric uh, neuropsychological assessment. Please welcome Dr. Cynthia. decide to take a shower and then actually do it. This has a lot to do with executive functioning, initiating a task, planning properly for the task, and actually putting enough cognitive resources to go through the task from A to C. And I think that this is something that we overlook a lot and that we take for granted a lot of the time. And when we work with adults or children with neurocognitive impairment, we notice that even those simple tasks are not that easy to do. So I'm going to start with a few uh, do you mind if I sit down? Is it okay? So, I'm going to start with a few definitions about what is a neuropsychological assessment. So, it is a procedure that we do. Is it okay? Can you say it? A, it's a procedure that we do that entails a lot of different steps interviewing, observation, tests, among other type, different types of tests that, are, that rely on performance that rely on observing the child, that rely on gathering information from different people who know the child. We tend to think assessment means testing. A neuropsychological assessment is not about psychometry. It's not just about the test. It's about doing different tests and procedures and putting those tests and procedures in a certain context. And knowing the context is the most important part of the assessment. And this is one of the messages that I want to try to pass today. So a neuropsychological assessment evaluates a lot of different things. So first, the cognitive functioning, the information processing, verbal skills, visual skills, different types of attention, different types of memory, emotional functioning, things that are more related to social cognition, empathy, understanding things from another person's perspective, regulating my emotion, which a lot of children with ADHD, for example, have major difficulties doing. And finally, adaptive functioning. And inside adaptive functioning, we have social skills. So when we talk about adaptive functioning is how do I use all the skills that I'm born with and that are developing with my chronological age to learn things in my daily life, to be independent in practical skills, to learn to read, to write, to do calculation, and to learn to make friends and maintain those friendships. So those are all the big baskets of adaptive skills that we also have to accept because we need to understand what is the impact of those cognitive problems in this child's daily life. And as I was saying before, it's a process. It's not just about testing. It always starts with a refer. Sometimes the refer comes from school, sometimes parents, sometimes pediatrician, psychiatrist, neurologist. But there's a refer question. And I often ask, what if, even if the refer is for, from parents and there's not a pediatrician who referred for this assessment, I ask, what is your refer question? What do you want to know? A lot of the time they say, I just want to know what's wrong with him. But after the interview process, after asking a lot of different questions to the parents, the referred question is usually very clear for both the clinician and the parents. And then there's yeah, the interview process, a very long and detailed interview. It's not just asking about the concerns. It's asking about every single cognitive domain and adaptive skill in this child's life and how the parents are currently dealing with it, how the school is currently dealing with it, what are the services that this child has benefited from in the past, and what we call, which medical doctors know very well, the history of present concern. When has all of this started? Was it sudden? Was it developmental? Has it always been the case? Have you always noticed that this child was different in certain behavior or learning abilities? And this is when we set 
a plan for assessment. A bit like the hypothetical deductive approach that we do in research, exactly the same. Start by observing, start by asking questions, then set the problem and the problem statement, and then starting with our testing to either rule out or rule in the hypothesis that we set when it comes to diagnosis or different strengths and weaknesses of each child. And after the whole process, there's the feedback that takes a lot of time because there's the feedback to the child, to the parents, to the school, and to all the different people who work with that child. We, a lot of different reasons for new, uh, referring for a neuropsych evaluation. So first, to improve diagnostic accuracy. This is something that we see every day. Does this child have ADHD or is it only anxiety? Uh, does he have a learning disability? Does he have a language disorder, a global development delay? So anything related to uh, diagnostic purposes, especially a neurodevelopmental disorder. But there's also a lot of assessment that should be done and that are being done in context of acquire a neurocognitive disorder. So for example, in cases of epilepsy in children, even in adults, but I mean here we're talking mostly about children, or traumatic brain injuries, or brain tumors, which unfortunately we do see in the clinic. So understanding what was the impact of the treatment it provided on the child's neurodevelopment, what was the pre and post, for example, in the context of TBI after, so establishing a baseline before doing different types of therapies or providing the medical doctor or providing treatment, and then reassessing after six months or a year to make sure that the progress is actually happening and going the direction that we need to. So, those are different things that we assess. So, IQ, the general intellectual functioning, different verbal skills, so vocab knowledge, understanding of different instructions, understanding of the place of meaning and language, visual spatial perception, motor and sensory functioning, all different types of attention, divided, selective, sustained, shifting of attention, executive functioning, which is something that I'm going to talk a lot because I believe that it's one of the most important aspects of the child development and unfortunately the most vulnerable. And it's understudied and underassessed and we don't give it as much importance as for example IQ when it's more correlated to a child's adaptive skills. Learning and memory, different types of memory, uh, emotional status and motivations, their social behavior, their adaptive behavior, quality of life, activities of daily living, and personality only when indicated. If we don't see the need, we don't have to go into extensive personality testing. So this I talked about. And we said, so this is something that I think a lot of psychologists know, all those skills on a continuum, from very low to very high. We use percentiles, we use these core neuropsychologists love statistics. We use all different types of statistical measure to specify the level of impairment or the level of strength and weaknesses of a child. Usually in the report we always have to put the descriptor because we use, as I said, a lot of, stat a lot of statistical measure. We consider in neuropsychology that any skill that is below minus 1.65 standard deviation, so below the mean of a certain age, is usually considered impaired. <coughs> so this is, for example, the measure of the risk. So this would, um, it, it would refer to an IQ of 70. And then we synthesize information from everything. To talk a bit about the test, I think that a lot of pediatricians get a lot of different reports with this, <coughs> TOVAs, with a lot. I think that those are the ones that you see the most, WISC, WIA, TOVA. It is, yeah, something that is, it's definitely tests that are very used, very important to use, and the primary tool that we tend to use. But when we conduct a neuropsych assessment, we tend to go a bit beyond just with Kentova to understand really the different skills underlying the problems, not only stopping there. We use a lot of different tests among those, but something, so those are just like a few examples, but the tests, so here I'm just adding a few pictures, a few examples of different tests for working, visual working memory, visual motor integration, visual spatial skills, memory, attention, verbal skills, semantic knowledge, so the stool, for example, for inhibition of memory bottom response. But something why I added those slides, just to shed a bit light on the importance of always being mindful about whether the test is culturally appropriate to this child, yes or no. So being someone who worked a lot in research when it comes to test adaptation, I know how much risk can come from administering a test to the child that's not appropriate for his language or culture. And 
out of lack of tools, we may think that, okay, let's translate the tool. But it doesn't work that way. So for example, in the IQ test, there's an item. So I'm, uh, I speak uh, English, French, and Arabic. So I do testing in those three languages. And when, before I was more knowledgeable in terms of test adaptation and measurement, I used to think that it, would be, it was okay to just translate the test. And I did it with a child. There was an item in one of the IQ tests that I administered that is a question about the thermometer. What, what is a thermometer used for? For those of you who understand or who can speak Arabic, can you tell me how it translates to Arabic? What is a thermometer used for? So if I want to translate verbatim, why do we use the tool to measure the temperature? To measure the temperature. How is it assessing vocab knowledge in a child? So there's so many items in testing that do not translate. And here, for example, this is an item of a test that is very used for naming abilities. I can certify that all the Middle Eastern kids that I assessed were not able to say that this is an asparagus. But all the French and American could say, because it's in their diet since very young age, but it's not in ours. It's not an item that I didn't even know that it was an asparagus before I mean, going into that and seeing this picture. So, we do fortunately have some tests in Arabic for those of you who do assessments in Arabic language to Arabic speaking kids. So I, uh, I adapted and developed the Lebanese Child Executive Functioning Battery two years ago. Those are the tests that were adapted to the Arabic language and we have quite a big normative data. Yes, it's, in, it's for Lebanese kids, Lebanese and Palestinian, but it is still easier to adapt a test that is actually in Arabic to other Arabic speaking children rather than going, to, to make, going from a Western test to an Arabic test. And it is a country where we do have a lot of children coming from different cultural backgrounds, so those are things that we need to be mindful of. And here are the norms, the papers, the papers for any person who would need to do that test to, to have access to those norms. And then when we're done with choosing the test and doing the whole procedure, we do different graphs to put all the child performance in the continuum. Now, just to put a bit on this information in context, how much time do I have? Five? Yeah, fine. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to skip a lot of things. So, I just want to give a bit of clinical context to the assessment and the need for an assessment. So, talking a bit about TBI, epilepsy, genetic condition, because I'm not going to talk about new developmental because they are coming for assessment. They're coming every day. We've heard by school, by parents, by pediatrician. But the kids that we don't see so much are the kids with concussion and traumatic brain injuries, for example. Once again, it depends on the country, but here I'm relating it to Dubai. Those are kids who do not come. And I asked a few pediatrician friends, like, why are those children not automatically referred for different assessments? They say because kids, they bounce back fast, they recover fast. If they have a language problem after a year of a bit of speech therapy, they speaking again. Yes, they do recover faster than it does, but only for kids that are that right? only for motor and language. Executive functioning, for example, is very vulnerable in childhood, and this has been known and known and published and published. And the younger the child, the worse the outcome. But the problem with that is that there's a delayed retardation, there's a delayed impairment. I'm not going to see the impairment now when a child who's five. I'm going to see the impairment when he's eight. At the age where he was supposed to develop executive functioning skills, because those skills spent they developed the twin factor. And at the age of chronological age where he was supposed to develop certain skills, he's not going to develop them. And it's going to impact significantly his academic, his social, and a lot of different behavior. It's going to impact a lot of his behavior in many ways. So here I just showed how delayed the difficulties can appear. They're not going to appear automatically. Uh, so I'm just going to skip here. So this is just to show you how common and what are the areas in TBI that are most commonly impacted. And even there in assessment, so we could think, okay, let's just do a bit of rehabilitation for executive functioning after a TBI. But it's not as simple because we need to know the type of frontal syndrome if any this child is presenting with. It's going to be very different whether his, what type of executive functioning is impacted. Here, so I'm just going to skip. And what, what type of frontal syndrome he's presenting with, which is extremely common. Ventral medial syndrome is going to give us a child later, much later, with severe opposition and defining disorder. I had a clinic yesterday, uh, parents who um, were telling me about so major 
guinea pig by putting it inside like uh, and, 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 and just a thing for cooking and he pasted it on the spatula and we started just going back and forth with it and being so happy when the guinea pig was moaning out of pain and shedding blood everywhere. And when I asked about the development of the yes, they mentioned um, that when he was three years old, he fell from the first floor balcony. And they were never referred to a proper evaluation. They never knew that this could potentially affect the behavior later on. This is just one among so many other symptoms that the child is presenting with uh, that are really impacting a lot of things, even his, I mean, all his relationships with it, and his very ability. <coughs> other type of symptoms that can lead to severe ADHD and attendance of the child, or mood disorder, or secondary ADHD. There was, uh, so I think that a lot of people are much in Dammer, the famous cannibal uh, serial killer. And there was uh, a lot of, uh, so I read a lot because I was quite interested to know what was the history of the type of personality. And there was a lot of, uh, I can't find my words, um, <coughs> evidence that he was also subject to major repetitive concussions when he was three years old due to abuse. Uh, this was one of the question marks that I mean about things that may have led to him showing those type of compulsive and very important <coughs> segregated behavior. Last thing that I can say one minute. Okay, so just to raise a bit of awareness about epilepsy. Yes, epilepsy is not always associated with cognitive disability. Sometimes the child develops properly, the child is okay. But a lot of the time, it's going to lead to a lot of cognitive disorders due to morphological factors and due to functional factors such as medication. And this is something that we tend to overlook. Uh, so just to finish on the International League Against uh, Epilepsy Guidelines. So there was a task force that was that put together a set of guidelines in 2016 and again in 2020 and they tried to always update those guidelines for pediatrician, neurologists, uh, neuropediatrician to know what is, a t how to care for the child's behavior development and so there was a lot of different recommendations based on evaluating the child for 10 years after seizure Evaluating. So, for example, we know that benign neurologic epilepsy is associated with severe behavior concerns and dyslexia. But at the same time, we never see those things in the clinic. But we always hear, like, from parents who incidental findings, if they come, for example, it's always an incidental finding. Oh, yeah, he had this when he was six years old. If we had known before, we would have said before, we would have had the child before, we would have had significantly better than now that he is 12 years old. So, those guidelines were there to shed light about the importance of that. For epilepsy surgery, for example, in our part of the world, we still see the WADA test being done in a way that is very routine. In the States and in Canada, for example, the neuroscience assessment, it, it, it replaced the WADA, and the WADA is only used when the neuropsychological assessment was not conclusive for localization of the epilepsy and surgical decisions, and the effect of treatments as well. If I the effect, <coughs> So a lot of different uh, different things that we have to take into account when we work with children with epilepsy, and a lot of reasons why it's definitely important to be assessing those children early on, as soon as uh, the diagnosis was put. I'm just going to go to the because I was not I was underestimating what is 25 minutes um, overestimated. Just take two messages. Um, so always consider a neuropsychological assessment when you have concerns about the child's whether there's any, any neurological condition or when, whether there's any concerns about the child behavior or cognitive or learning problems, do not be interpret testing. An IQ of 60 does not always mean intellectual disability. A child with ADHD and very smart can have a per scale IQ of 60 because it's like a GPA. If he's very bad at one test but very good at others, he's going to have a poor per scale IQ. It doesn't mean he's intellectually disabled. And an IQ test is not enough. As a pediatrician, if you receive an assessment with only an IQ test or only a TOGA, do not interpret that out of context. Request for more. Request for more comprehensive testing for diagnostic conclusion and for proper recommendation. And not all psychologists are trained to do assessments. This is something that as a pediatrician you should know. You should send to people that are actually specialized in that. And there's no value in repeating testing every year. Schools, for example, we tend to see 
this coming from school. Those kids, they come every year. And I don't mind, I can assist them every year. This is not, but there's really no value unless there's a reason. Traumatic brain injury, free ankles, epilepsy, after surgery, okay. But just assessing a kid with ADHD every year, there's absolutely no value in that. Those are just the key conversations that I want to 